Welcome back to 8701. In this second chapter, we will discuss symmetries and the importance of symmetries in physics in general, but also especially in particle physics and nuclear physics. So we start with a short introductory video and then we move on into more details as we go along. The importance of symmetries cannot be understated in physics. Um, and there's two aspects which are important. The first one is that symmetries and conservation laws go hand in hand, as discussed by Mercer's theorem. Um, to, to express the theorem in an informal way, you can say that if a system has a continuous symmetry uh, property, then there are corresponding properties whose values do not change with time, meaning that they're conserved. You can express this more sophisticated and say to every differentiable symmetry generated by local action, there is correspondence, uh, there's a correspondent conserved current. And we're going to look at those uh, actions and currents as we go along. Um, the second aspect, beyond the fact that there's conservation laws, is that you can understand um, physics experiments and nature uh, if you know that the physics has an underlying symmetry without fully understanding the, um, the physics or the mathematical backgrounds in order to do calculation in detail. So knowing that there's an underlying symmetry can help um, really expressing or understanding the physics behavior of experiments. A few historic remarks on Emmy Noether. Emmy Noether was born in Germany in, um, in the 1880s in um, Erlangen, um, where she grew up and also uh, studied mathematics at the University of Erlangen. After getting her degree, she worked for a full seven years uh, at the university in the math department and received zero dollars. And not just because it wasn't the currency being used there, but at that time, a uh, woman didn't really have a prominent role in academia, and so there was no job for her to take. Um, but her uh, talents and her qualification was seen in the mathematical world at the time, uh, specifically in the center of the mathematical world, which, world, which was in Göttingen. Um, so Hilbert um, basically discovered her and asked her to come to Göttingen um, in order to do habilitation. She hab did get in habilitation in Göttingen in 1919 and then stayed in Göttingen till the situation in Europe degraded in the 1930s. So and then she was born um, Jewish and uh, couldn't stay in Göttingen uh, beyond the year 1933 and then had to immigrate into the United States where she um, worked at uh, Brian Moyer College and also uh, with Princeton. Um, her work, I mean, you see here her um, habilitation, uh, which is in German, invariante variationsprobleme, in, invariant variational problems, um, was highly regarded and she had a lot of influence and impact on various um, strands in mathematics and physics. Unfortunately, she passed away already um, when she was about um, 50 years old. Uh, she you know, was diagnosed with some sort of cancer and passed away really, really quickly after, this, uh, after some surgery. Um, her temperature rise and a few days later, she, was, she passed away. Um, to come back to symmetries and conservation laws, um, so every symmetry of nature yields a conservation law. That is what Noether's theorem tells you. And you can revert this to saying that every conservation law in physics reflects an underlying symmetry. And uh, examples for this are um, the fact that, you know, the, the, the properties, the laws of physics are invariant under time translation, meaning that physics is the same yesterday, the same tomorrow, and it's going to be the same next week. And out of this, we can deduce energy conservation. Similarly, translation in space results in uh, momentum conservation. Angular rotations or rotations result in angular momentum. And then a little bit harder to grasp, but we will see this in more detail. Internal um, symmetries can also lead to conservation laws. And gauge transformation leads to the conservation of charge. So there's internal symmetries as well. 
Um, before we dive into more detail, a few things, you know, those, those um, in many cases, um, symmetry, symmetry operations can be expressed via matrices um, or groups. And uh, there's a few um, uh, rules or, you know, operations which are rather important and define, define the symmetry. So the first one is that, you know, any, any symmetry operation has to have identity, meaning there has to be an operation which doesn't do anything um, with an element of this group. There has to be closure, meaning that if you apply a first transformation and then a second, the resulting transformation is again a part of the set of transformations. Uh, there is an inverse, meaning that you know if you rotate in one direction, you can rotate back. Um, and there's an uh, associativity, meaning that you know if you have a rotation acting on two other rotations, you can regroup um, and, and follow what's shown in this equation here. It's not clear that you can revert the order of uh, certain um, elements of your, of your group or your uh, symmetry operation. Um, you can classify them, however, those where you can commute, uh, those called, called abelian groups, and those where you cannot, those are non-abelian groups. Um, all right, so with this, um, we uh, have introduced the, with the first uh, video symmetries, and now we just dive into more detail in understanding continuous symmetries and also discrete symmetries and what we can learn from them. 